Hey everybody, welcome. It's David Newman from Do It Marketing and today I've got a hugely special treat for you. My friend Hendrik Jan Franke from Bright Orange Thread, brightorangethread.com, uh, internet marketing, web marketing, digital presence expert, is going to share with us some, some do's and don'ts, some best practices around making your website pay off and making your website generate leads and business and sales and marketing effectiveness. Hendrik Jan, welcome. Well, thank you, thank you. Such a friendly, warm welcome. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Did I now that that was a pretty big setup? That was you know. I, I hope you're ready here. I hope. Yeah, you're ready you to... you you might have seen me smile amusedly because you know that's a that's a, a big set of shoes to shell. But honestly, it is. I mean, when we break it down and get into some of the stuff, it it's very doable. Yep, absolutely. This is what we do for clients. So, I mean, they don't hire us unless we give them some results. So. Well, and let's, you know, I want to start off right away because you start where I start, and there's not many web and digital marketing folks that do this. You start where I start, which is messaging. What's the message? What's the value prop? What are you trying to convey before we even talk about technology and tools and tidbits and widgets? Talk Absolutely. to me about messaging. Where do you see your clients get it right? Where do you see your clients get it wrong? And what can you share about messaging? Well, clients, as you know, they're so they know what they do so well, and they can talk with all their acronyms, and they can say all kinds of stuff, which is what I tend to call, you know, client or consultant outspeak, you know, and they'll use acronyms and all this kind of stuff and buzzwords that, you know, when they're talking to their fellow professionals, make a lot of sense. But translating that into a benefit for the prospect who's interested in their services, that can be overkill, uh, confusing. So we call this client in language, um, which ties into our core competency of just being user friendly and so forth. So we call it client in language. So for example, for myself, I could talk about myself that we do search engine optimization. And I think people generally know what that is, but it always, even if they generally know what it is, there's this little blip in their thinking of, What's that mean for me? So instead, let's write about the fact that we're going to bring more traffic, more visitors to your website. That is a kind of instantaneous connection. Um, in one of your talks, you had a great way of saying it. Um, use the language that they use. I, it, you, you have a wonderful way of saying it. Yeah, yeah. We call it client in language. We call it client in language. Right, exactly. My my soundbite on that. And again, this is why you know this is why we're talking because you and I are so in sync, and I do some of the marketing and the strategy part, and you do all the wonderful digital marketing stuff. But it's totally in sync. My my phrase for that is uh, talk about prospect problems using prospect language. Right. Yes. So you know, better. talk prospect yeah. language about prospect problems. Now, so you talk about developing an audience centric, a a customer centric um, mm -hmm. messaging. Sounds great. Easier said than done. How do you do that? You know, it's about listening to the client themselves. If you start talking to them enough about when they're on a sales call or they're meeting with someone, we can easily listen to that for a little bit and we can start to hear the problems that they're solving for their clients. And then it's a bit of just twisting it around. You know, it's almost like with the old film, you know, you had negative film and you made a positive image. They're going to talk in the negative and we just flip it into the positive. And with our experience, we don't find that terribly hard to do. Um, the clients have the information there, especially the sales and marketing people. You know, I think if you're talking to some backroom developer or, uh, you know, backroom technician, they're not going to have it. But the ones that are interfacing and talking to clients usually are answering questions that are these clients' issues, their prospects' issues. And so we can listen and then translate that around. Fantastic. Now, I know another thing that separates you and uh, you have your fabulous team member there behind you. So you're running a real company. We should just say that. You know, I'm, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm here in my office with like, you know, my kids' drawings from like 10 years ago back when they oh, were yeah. seven, yeah, eight yeah. years old. I've got my books and my toys and my, my can of V8 yes. up here. So it's just me and the dog over here. But like you, you look at you, dude. You're you're like yeah. in an office. You've got well, you've yeah. Got person, you've got a person who gets paid money by you to do work. Yeah, you know we have can, we have we have a lot of clients that we're taking. Ask her to of. say hi. Ask her to say hi to everybody. Chelsea, can you wave hi to the camera? <laughs> so. Chelsea, man, you rock. You're awesome, and you, you have um, the world's best boss. <laughs> Tell her that too. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. I'll pass that on. I wish I was on speakers now. You could be. Everyone could hear yeah, this. Yeah, there you go. 
<laughs> well, the other thing where I started to go and then I got derailed because, you know, you're really there in an office. Uh, another thing that separates you, certainly mm -hmm. in my experience with all the web folks and the digital marketing folks that I work with, <clears throat> you talk about usability. Mm -hmm. Website usability. This can be a pretty esoteric kind of out there topic, right. but I'll tell you, it is so vitally important. Talk about web usability and your philosophies and sound bites around why it's important. Yeah, usability is a principle of just making things easy to use, and honestly, this can apply to tanking gas too at a gas station. I mean, there's usability with that gas pump, but for websites, it's just how do I help someone arrive on your website and find quickly the answer to their question. So a prospect arrives on a website, they have some question, let's say it's about CRM systems, you know, but they have a question like, does it integrate with X? That's their one question, and they want to find that answer out about and so they're going to look around your website, they're going to poke around, they're going to click some links. Well, poking around can be dangerous because if it goes on endlessly, they're kind of unsatisfied. So we want to get them to their answer quickly. That's what we think about usability. That's kind of what we're doing. Admittedly, my prospect, my clients, they have messaging that needs to reach that prospect. Not only do we have to find their answer to the prospect's question quickly, but we've also got to tell them something about our client in the meantime. Um, and so that's where usability comes in and copywriting comes in and messaging comes in and it all ties together. But that usability is, uh, and the usability, there's, uh, that's a jargon word. We've got to be careful here because, you know, that's, that is consultant out speak. But in client in speak, that is make something easy to find. Behind that is best practices. There's a ton of people doing research, publishing that research. There are reports you can buy at $500 a copy, you know, all from different vendors, all about the research they're doing about what people click, what people do in certain scenarios, and absorbing that information and using that to develop a website is very important. Eye tracking studies are done to see how people's eyes move across the screen and where do those eyes land and so forth. Like one of those things tells us that and this is a copywriting thing, but the first three words in a headline are critical. The headline on the top of the page is critical, and the first three words in there are critical. Because if you look at eye tracking studies, people don't read the entire headline. You know, the hot spot is the first three words, and you gotta quickly define in those three words that there's more information that's relevant. In the sense of, if I finish reading this headline, I'm gonna find good information. When I finish reading the headline, it's going to tell me, hey, this web page has good information for me, and so on. That's, so, that's, that's us bringing usability into the forefront on a website. I love that, and I want to ask you a couple more questions about it, but even that tidbit about the first three words in the mm -hmm. headline, things like, you're, uh, you're, you're doing it wrong, <laughs> although that's, that's four words, uh, right, you know, right. make more money, get right. more clients, generate mm -hmm. more leads, again, Headline, subheads, I love what you're saying, that mm -hmm. we're a culture of scanners. Yes, you know, no one, yes, no one yes. reads anything. So mm -hmm. one of the tests that folks listening uh, and watching could actually do on their website, if you just looked at your website with the headlines and the subheads, using the first three words as like extra credit, if mm -hmm. people just read the headlines and the subheads, would they get the message or not? Now, here's, here's how you fail this test. If your web copy includes no headlines and no subheads and it's this right. big gray wall of text, well, you, you get an F. Sorry. Right. I mean, right. you lose. So, yeah. so what else? Talk about, talk about bullet. I mean, let's take this one level down. Let's talk oh, about sure. scanning patterns, uh, bullets, some, some of these other like copywriting secrets that you found effective. Well, you're, you're, so every paragraph on a web page should have a heading. Every paragraph should have a heading. That allows someone to read the headline, then each heading down the page. And that should give them the overview of the story. And at any point in the time, they want to get more in depth about a particular part of the story, particular section, they can then read the paragraph. Okay. Now, of course, that paragraph should be three, four sentences long. And I'm not talking four sentences long where you've taken compound sentences and semicolons, and if you broke it up, you could make it into eight sentences. I'm talking about four sentences. One good long one to show knowledge and thinking, three others to set it up. We don't want a wall of text, because like you said, they're scanning. Like we say, they're scanning. We call this chunkification. We want bro copy chunkified, broken up into different pieces. Every paragraph has a heading. Um, 
it just makes life so much easier that people just step down the page and boom, boom, boom. They're boom, yeah, boom. huge, huge. Now you talk about chunkifying, and I know that you also believe in chunkifying other things beyond the text. How else can we chunkify or modularize or simplify right. everything on the website so people get to what they want quickly and can write that check to you faster? <laughs> right. The the you want to take a paragraph. Like we are, our objective is usually to find one paragraph, and an important paragraph, and can we make that a bulleted list? Three, four things. Don't make a bulleted list that's ten things long because by the time I get to bullet six, I've forgotten bullet one, and it makes it hard for me to put the big picture back together. So we have to be really good editors, thinkers of our content, and turn that into a short bulleted list. We like a page to generally to have one bulleted list on it because people can then quickly, it'll kind of stand out visually, as importance because it's textually different than a wall a paragraph is and then it creates this anchor point of someone finding the key points on a page so yeah well there's a takeaway for me right there and I I think of myself as pretty good at some of this stuff so number one all my bullet lists are seven eight nine ten items long I'm gonna go back and change that most and this is you know some of its sales pages some of its its descriptions of products and services like we all have as business owners but I'll tell you, uh, even uh, I'll have three or four bullet lists on a single page. And again, I'm going to change that based on your advice. And so, so you know, it really, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, and well, then we'll move on to some other things about usability and lead generation. Um, it sounds to me like less is more. That, you know, this whole concept of long sales copy versus short sales copy where do you fall on that? Is, in fact, less more? Or are there times when you want to have a more extensive online conversation with somebody and long copy is okay? I mean, what, what are your thoughts there? Long copy is always okay in our book, but we need a good headline at the top of the page that helps people understand what's on the page, the breadth of the page, and then we need those subheadings throughout or headings per paragraph to help people scan the page. People will scroll down when they have a jargon, excuse me, but it's information sent. Does the headline give them the idea, the scent, that the information they're looking for is on the page? Then they'll start scanning. And that's why the headings for every page is important. To us, the biggest obstacle is return on investment. Long copy can always be there. I, every page could be a long page if you want it to be. And if it's well chunkified, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be short. But the problem is cost, right? Cost generating content and then time and energy cost editing, chunkifying the content. So at that point, maybe budgetary reasons, we strategically pick the pages that need the long copy and let them explain the expertise, give them really solid advice in a particular area. For us, let's say here, copy on a website, on a web page. That's what I'm doing here. I'm giving in-depth information. But maybe I don't need to do that about another topic, you know, and so I don't. Um, and then we use short pages strategically, right? When is it short? When is it long? Things like that. Like the About Us or the History page, I don't know that that needs to be particularly long, right? I mean, we are not the city of Washington, D.C., where there's, you know, rich in history, right? We're, we're bright orange thread. We're, we're do it marketing. You know, our company lifespans are shorter. They're not as impactful. So we don't need to be in-depth, but we need to give the overview. So yeah, long no, pages can work, though. Long pages can work. Just they have to be good, solid ones. Right, right, exactly. Well, let's do, let, well, I'm going to do a little bit of a short commercial break, not, not really a commercial, but talk about Bright Orange Thread. I mean, obviously, the website is brightorangethread.com. Right, right. But how else can people get in touch with you? How, how do they stay up with your, your own thought leadership and your own advice and wisdom and social media, blog, all right, that stuff? Right. Yeah, we're on, we blog. Well, that's the heart of what we're doing, sharing some of the content. We have blog articles on chunkification, on headline writing, um, things like why we hate certain types of portfolio websites, you know, like, you know, certain diatribes we do about people making mistakes because, you know, one day I got upset looking at Illustrator's websites and I was chasing that next button over here, down over here, down over Just let me click. Dick, same spot all the time. That's kind of what we like to do. Um, so we have that kind of stuff in our blog, um, which then connects to our email newsletter so that people can kind of get that information on a regular basis on their own. We, we send it out once a month. We don't want to bug people to death with all kinds of information. But if you're in, if you're a VP of marketing, then hey, this could be good for you just as a way to get some 
additional perspective on a few things to keep you motivated in terms of keeping your website fresh, those kinds of things. And then we break those blog articles, newsletters into tweets and share them across Twitter. So um, we share that at h at h f r a n c k e at you know that's our Twitter handle there. Um, and you can sign up for our newsletter right off our website. So you get a nice once a month type thing. So. Fantastic. No, that's really, really good. And I, I want to talk I want to talk the third part of our discussion, because our two parts of our discussion so far have been number one, messaging, mm -hmm. number two, usability. I, I want to talk about design, because obviously part of part of what you do is, is web design. And I'm glad we're getting to that third because that really is the order of importance, isn't it? Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, yeah. even before we get there, even before we get to the design component. Talk about your sweet spot clients, kind of what sort of clients you typically end mm -hmm. up working with, what kind of clients come to you, sort of the scope and the scale of the projects that you help them with. Give right. us a little bit of a, a mini portfolio, if you would. Yeah, our clients, um, we work with VPs of marketing, people who are structuring and implementing a marketing plan for a company, $5 million and up in revenue or something like that. Um, and they want help with different phases, whether it's the SEO, the social media marketing, the website itself, content generation. We can help with those different pieces. Sometimes we're doing it. Sometimes we're advising on it. Um, like we've done work for a trade association where you know they have ten content experts in ten different sub areas of their whole thing, you know. And so we run a training class on writing for the web, how to create tweets, how to use Twitter, how to use Hootsuite, those kinds of things. Other times we help clients do those things. Um, so we can be kind of flexible about what we're doing. Um, and then um, where, what was the other part of that question? Uh, uh, just typical, you know, typical types of clients, different industries, oh, right. different market segments that you're in. Um, well, 40% of our clients are nonprofits. So you know, we do some serious work on that front. Um, and those websites and communications are the more communications hubs. But then for business, 60% of our businesses, it's B2B type websites that we do a lot of. So they're interested in content marketing. They're developing thought leadership type blog posts and so forth. So we help create websites and marketing plan or implement marketing plans around that. We don't write marketing plans. Um, we help implement. So. Um, and then we'll create a lead capture website. So if there's a white paper or a video like like this video that we create today could be behind a lead capture form, and how do we get someone? To, oh, this is great stuff. And then you know their sales team has a name and an address to uh, to follow up on. Right. So the website so, gets it, it. It goes to work. It goes to yes, work generating right. leads. It doesn't just sit there and look pretty. Yeah. Well, you said earlier about the order. Yes, messaging. Usability and design, but you know, looking pretty is that great first impression piece that you need. Well, let's you know? go there. Yeah, let's yeah, go. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes talk about design. Talk about the 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 expense from a lead generating uh, mm -hmm. standpoint. The expense of goofy design, bad design, homemade design, and we've all seen these websites, folks. Right. And it's not just small companies that have the mm -hmm. homemade goofy website. It can be you know one, two, five, ten million dollar company that just has totally right. neglected this. What's the cost of a goofy website uh, in terms of leads and credibility? And then what do you recommend for really smart design? Well, the, the older designs, the goofy designs, you know, the problem is that they're based on people's experience of using the, webs, the web five, ten years ago. The web is evolving so fast that design has to keep up. Um, and the first thing designers do is just going to give you a first impression, a sense of professionalism, a sense that it's going to be easy to find the information you want on a website. Older websites tend to be very dense and cluttered, and we're now realizing the importance of just get the main message there first, layer them carefully instead of trying to have 10 messages all blinking at someone at the same time. Um, and then the good design will solve those problems. A good design will just keep things clean. They'll match your brand. Um, they won't make it look like you're selling shoes to teenage girls. They'll help you say that I am selling CRM systems to uh, you know Fortune 500 companies, or I am um, you know selling marketing advice to to serious companies. So yeah, you want something professional, clean. It's not easy. I mean, the problem is you can have so many textures and you can get crazy and creating something clean, harmonious, and it takes people, what, what was it, two-tenths of a second to know whether it's visually pleasing. I mean, that's where good design is important because that first impression is the same thing as the guy walking in through the door. Is he in a nice clean suit or is it all rumpled 
or is it in his leather biker gear? You know, it's like those kinds of impressions really, you know, shade you. Trust me, the biker gear is a great impression in the right venue, but other times the business suit's required. So, right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and then there's also the third impression where the guy walks in with a hot dog and there's a mustard stain on his lapel, and you're like, wow, this guy's kind of a poor homeless bum. Well, right, and that piece ties into content management systems. Because people have trouble updating their website, they end up with the mustard on their tie, but it's on their website. It looks the website looks old, or there's a typo, and they just don't have the energy to fix it. With today's systems, it should be so easy to update a website that a typo should be fixed in three seconds. You know, so, oh, I noticed a typo on page fixed. It should just be that quick, and that is possible in today's market. I mean, there's just so many wonderful systems out there. It should just be easy, and you don't have to be a web guru to do this. I mean. You know, you just if they can, I don't know if they can use the world's most simple, the most simplest version of Microsoft Word, they can update a website. Um, or know. at least that's how it should be. That's how it should be. Oh, every company should have a platform that enables that these days. If they I'll don't, tell you, but they it's always mustard. yeah, no, they have the mustard. Well, and here's another piece of mustard. One of my pet peeves, right at the bottom of the website, copyright 2006. Right. right. These are computers. Websites know exactly what today date right, is. Right, right. So, so you have copyright from 2002 because that's when your website launched. And then, you know, <laughs> at second zero one of 2014, it should just change to 2014 because it's a copy. It's a computer. It knows what the right. date is. That's Someone so should true. just. It's a simple little script to write. Yeah. So now yeah. let's talk. Let's talk just the last couple of points because this has been fabulous. Um, how do our three circles connect? So we talked about a little bit of messaging, a little bit of usability, a little bit of design. How does the design impact things like the usability or the conversion, the lead generation, and so on? Um, well, we've done wireframes that are pretty gray looking but have nice hierarchy to them. And some of our clients are ecstatic about that. They almost joke that that should be their website um, because it's already improvement, because there's hierarchy in the data. So good design will not mess up the messaging. That Maybe that's the first thing it doesn't do, is good design doesn't mess up the usability, doesn't mess up the messaging. And then from there, it just enhances it. It makes it even clearer where is a button to click, um, what's the action of that button, um, making it easy for someone to get their mouse on top of the button that it's not so tiny, things like that. Good design will take care of, um, and it will match your brand. You know, uh, you know, our company is bright orange thread, so it has to be orange. Has to be somewhere. Does it have to dominate? No, but if there was never orange, there would be a disconnect. Um, companies have other pieces out there that they're, you know, they have trade shibu, so they have ads that they're running. This all needs to connect visually so that we don't trip up going from bright orange thread to bright red thread, right? I mean, it's not a big deal. It doesn't seem like, but it can be. So you, there has to be a visual consistency. So, so. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Let's talk. Uh, I want to go off on a little bit of a detour and then a couple wrap-up okay. questions. The, the sure. quick detour, which is more and more important these days, let's talk about mobile design. Mobile design, iPads, cell phones, mm -hmm. smartphones. What is going on? What you know? Even web design from two years ago may be yes. out of date if it looks funky on an iPhone or a Android or an iPad. So, talk to me about mobile. Well, people are spending the, so much website traffic is now coming from mobile devices. It's just you know up, an upward curve, um, and you have to be aware if your audience is going to do that. So, like for our B two B clients, we're not that worried about the smartphone. Um, we make it presentable, but we're presenting usually in-depth content that's a little, it's too much, too thoughtful to be on a smartphone, to be truly absorbed on a smartphone. But we can still give a first good first impression on the smartphone. We can still give the high overview of how they're helpful, what problems are they going to solve for prospects. We can still do that on a smartphone, and so we should, because you never know someone you meet at a networking function, at a trade show, and they just check you out quickly. That still needs to be positive impression, and it still needs to give the high 50,000-foot overview. Then when we get to the tablets, that's where people can really spend some time reading at a trade show, you know, let's say, or a conference. They can just sit there and swipe and read. So definitely for our B2B clients, we're making those websites iPad-friendly for full content absorption. And then, of course, the desktops, right? I mean, people still do a decent amount of work on those things when they're at work, and so we make them 
friendly. But we honestly sometimes start with a mobile first approach because of the brevity of the screen. It makes us hyper focused on making that content short, concise, and effective. Um, sometimes when we have more space, we think, ah, oh, you know, we'll use what's extra two words. Well, you know, why not keep it short, brief? You know, it just helps people get through the day and get through their websites quickly. So wow, no, that there's another huge nugget is mobile first. You know, think, think compact, mm -hmm. think concise, and then you know, don't don't let the big. If you have a big, you know, 21 inch monitor, right. your job is not to fill the 21 inch monitor. Mm -hmm. Your job is let's look at a seven inch screen or a four inch screen. That's that's your capacity, and then anything else above that is a luxury. Right. Yeah, and then Love you get that. A, and you get density on the on the desktop space, you know. A nice dense headline instead of a lot of fluff and extra words and Yeah, you know, fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, last last question then I want to kind of just circle back with all your contact info and how people can sure. keep up with all your future adventures. Let's talk about hiring a web design firm or a digital marketing firm. What should people look for? What are some red flags and some things to avoid? What are some things that might indicate, hey, this company really knows what they're doing in the digital marketing, web marketing world? Right. The, we've come up with a few litmus test type questions, and these are ones that you can do before you even talk to a firm. You should visit their website, and then you should look at some of the websites they've designed. Um, one of the things you could look for is that is a phone number and email address up in the header, something that just made contact really informative easy um, because in the end we're building a website to generate leads we need connections right um, so some people are email centric give it to them some people are phone centric give it to them put them up there and if their websites are doing that consistently all right we've got some hope for this guy um, you could check out how their portfolio works you know is it really hard to get around their portfolio and look at a bunch of different images or is it really easy if it's really easy you're gonna sense that they have usability best practices in mind and they're probably gonna therefore help your website be easy to use your website will be different than theirs because you're not gonna have a portfolio of images but their portfolio is easy to get around then um, I would I would think that those that would be something a good litmus test um, the other one is S search engine optimization related. Um, if someone knows how to view source code, when you right click on a page, you can view the source code. And you can do a search for H1. H1 is a tag bit of code. But if you search for H1, do they have it on the page? And is it only one per page? And if that's the case, then you have I think they'll build websites that are search engine friendly to make your website more easy to be found. And those are three things you can do without ever having talked to them. Um, and then you could, when you talk to them, two things we would think about doing is um, ask them about process. How is this thing going to go down? What's the phases and so forth? And if they start with design first, oh, we'll show you a bunch of pretty pictures first. Does that tie into the conversation we just had? Uh-uh. They need to talk about your content. So they might ask you, maybe you test if they ask you, can we see your analytics? Your website should have analytics on it. You should be tracking what pages are most popular. You should be doing that right now. And they should want to know that information. They sh and then, because they're going to want to know how that ties into your overall marketing objectives, how things are changing. So um, once you start talking to them, what's the process? Do they mention design first? Or do they mention content and messaging first? Content messaging is first in the process. Good sign. Um, and then one indicator if that they're interested in content is, did they ask to see your analytics? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Wow, this has been this has been and, and again, you know, I, I, I know all this stuff and I've learned a tremendous amount from our conversation. Great. So Great. this has just been tremendous. Uh, once again, brightorangethread.com, uh, H Franke on Twitter, H F R A N C K E, and you, you saw Hendrik Jan's little subtitle there, so you know how to spell his last name. Uh, yeah, what else? Sorry about what that. else? <laughs> where else where else can people tap into the ball of bright orange thread. Oh, those are great places. Um, you know, go to the website, sign up for our newsletter, and, and we'll we'll give you a bunch of stuff. One, well, not a bunch, but over a year, a bunch. Once a month, we'll send you some useful information about websites, just to keep you thinking about it, so that you can keep your website to the forefront and fresh of uh, a quality website. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, Hendrik Jan Franke, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Yes. I'm, I'm going to see you because we're at, you know, it's funny. We, we, we do these programs. Oh, here's my friend so-and-so, and it's the first time right. they've ever met, you know. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing you on Thursday. We're getting together yes. Thursday, we're right? Getting together. Yeah. And uh, we'll yeah, just yeah. go on from there, and yeah. I'll send you this video, and it's going to be awesome. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and oh, uh, it's really appreciate, yeah, I appreciate your wisdom. Oh, you're welcome, man. It's been a pleasure talking to you on the video. Thanks. It's been cool. <laughs> All right. All Thanks, right. David. See you soon. See you tomorrow.